And it's, it's a constant learning process. There's so much preparation involved and in, in being ready on time. And I think that just whole getting ready for the Lord to come. Welcome to Walk Like a Hebrew. This podcast was born out of a desire to tell people's stories of crossing over from one life to another, reading the whole Bible, becoming a Hebrew, and walking like our Messiah. We are Torah pursuant people, striving to live by Yehovah's law while accepting Yeshua's amazing grace. We keep the seventh day Sabbath, we eat biblically clean. And we keep the feasts and festivals of Leviticus 23, just like our Messiah did. I'm Jody O'Dell, and this is episode 23. My guest this week is Denise Nairmore of Northern California. Denise told me her coming to Torah story, but most of our conversation was actually about other things. First, her recent divorce, and second, our shared love of all things linen, and how the making of linen mirrors our Christian walk. We also talked about some of the weird projects we get into sometimes and listening to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget to check out the bonus clips later this week for my views on prophecy and a short discussion of undergarments. Don't miss that one. Walk Like a Hebrew is entirely listener-supported. Please consider donating by visiting sheholdsforth.com slash donate or by subscribing to podhero.com, where $5.99 a month can help support all of your favorite podcasters. And I'm happy to announce that Walk Like a Hebrew is now a part of the FaithCasts community. Visit faithcasts.com to discover great Christian podcasts like this one to help you keep the faith. Welcome to Walk Like a Hebrew. I'm here tonight with Denise Nairmore of Northern California. Hi, Denise. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Finally, I've been chasing you for a year to do an interview. Well, it's not quite a year, but long time. Really glad we finally are getting to do this for real. Yes. Can you tell the listeners a little about yourself? Sure. Um, Both my grandparents were Christians. And so I have this cute little tape of my grandmother when I was five praying me in. So I always saw myself as a Christian, but um, I am recently divorced. I have four kids. I um, live with my youngest daughter only right now and working up a storm. <laughs> working up a storm. That's good. The world has gone crazy. Yeah. Absolutely insane. I think everybody honestly really needed to be aware of their germs. So if for that, I'm kind of thankful. I'm just hoping people are understanding the natural aspect of being clean and, and sanitized. Yeah. That's a big difference from the pharmaceutical company ridiculousness. Well, can you tell me about your faith background? Yeah. Yeah, where you came from, how you got here? Um, Well, we started going to church when I was 11, and I immediately just shot my hand up in the air at the end of prayer and said, yes, you know, I want Jesus in my heart. And I had a physical presence come up to my heart and knock on the door, open the door, walk in shut the door, walk down the steps to my heart. And I asked my mom and my best friend on either side of me if they had heard that or felt that. And they said, no. And uh, I just felt really special about that. So I always go back to that time and knowing that the Lord is with me. And then I just, you know, kept growing in my faith and different things, taking Bible studies and stuff in the different churches we attended. And then um, one time I had a friend that just kept saying at the end of a conversation, you know, I have a friend that says this. What do you think about that? I'd be able to ponder that till the next time we talked. And then she'd say something else and something else. So I was mulling for a while. And then at VBS, we both had our kids there. And she said, you know, I'm gonna, let's, let's meet up for VBS. I want you to meet her. And so we met up and immediately connected. And she did um, wonders in discipling me and taking me under her wing and sharing all of the information that she had about different stuff. And it was just a wonderful time. I am so thankful for her and her family and all the gifts that they bring to this walk and the feasts. And um, 
I, I don't know where I'd be if she hadn't come into my life. But, you know, I've kind of always had that draw to things that were biblical. You know, I've kind of given up on pork. I never really ate ham. And um, I always knew you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. And I uh, knew that those prayers that we're going to sing when we get to Yahweh's presence is they were going to be done in Hebrew. And someday I was going to learn Hebrew or something, you know, and I think this was just the next step in my journey to truly open those doors of faith and help me to walk through it. So was it one particular? Well, Sabbath was really the first thing. But I think that year we did Passover too as a a family, as our first Passover just by ourselves, other than with a home group we had done years ago. It was like January when I started first hearing these things. And I think it was August before I really dedicated to honoring the Sabbath every Shabbat. And so your husband didn't go along and that ultimately... Led to divorce, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. But you know, we're we're on good terms, and he really wants to see me be successful in whatever I choose to do and be sanctified in my walk a bit. We choose to walk in different ways of sanctification, and hopefully, you know, there's hope for reconciliation in the future. I I'm open for that, but I still think we have a long way to go if that were to happen. Yeah. Well, it is very, very common for women to come into this and their husbands not follow. And it's unfortunate. And it makes me wonder why. What is it about women? Why are we able to see this so often when men can't? And I know there are men who come into it without their wives, but that seems to be much more rare. Yeah, no, I I agree for sure. Um, I think... You know, there's a teaching that you said you followed, too, that talked about the Holy Spirit and the wife and, you know, just the whole marriage covenant and how things are to work. And I really think it's true. You know, we have different gifts as couples, and that's why we're together and we work for um, a certain purpose. And he has his giftings and I have my giftings and maybe my vision is clear at some point. Um, And he did have some good reasons to kind of go the way he did. But, you know, I think you just have to continue to search a matter out to see if it's true, despite what other people's circumstances may have been. And that's what he's basing it off is other people's testimonies and, and some prophecy that was going on at the time. And that's, that's not what we're doing. You know, it's, I mean, yes, prophecy is involved, but it's so much more than that. Yeah, yeah. Prophecy, especially in the mainstream church, people are so obsessed with eschatology and the end times. And I think it started to come about with the Left Behind series. And then you had the Bible studies with Daniel and Revelation. and, And it's funny because nobody in all of those Bible studies, I never once heard that the biblical feasts were prophetic and that they would be prophetic of both the first coming and the second coming. That was never brought up in any of those mainstream Mm. Bible studies that I did on the subject. I like in this walk how we keep the feasts in order to rehearse for what is to come. That's it. And it's it's a constant learning process. There's so much preparation involved and and being ready on time. And I think that just whole getting ready for the Lord to come. Yeah. And, you know, some of us get decorative at times with our sukkahs. You know, it's kind of fun to make it homey, especially for the kids or or company. But there's the other aspects that are there that hopefully people start to catch on to, you know, and what significance that they have. You know, I I enjoy it. It's, you know, I've, I've been camping my whole life, but it's taken it to another level for me. And now I can't stop. So I do it all the time. I'm <laughs> sukkahing at other people's property and houses, no matter what, all the I time. Know. Well, Sukkot is what actually inspired me to do this podcast, because it seems like going from campfire to campfire, the first thing anybody asks when you sit down is, so tell me, how did you get here? Yeah. <laughs> and I just love those stories. And then the other thing at Sukkot, and this is a great segue into this other topic I wanted to talk about, you meet a lot of people and everybody's very different, but there's something very particular about Hebrew people, Hebraic type people, whatever we call ourselves. And what do you call us anyway? You know, it's, and I know everybody says this, but it's different depending on the person. (laughs) And you know, yeah. there's a new word out that's going to get passed around, hopefully. And I just might be calling myself a Lennonite. We'll see. A Lennonite. <laughs> yes. Thank you. 
just like in the video that you shared with me, and um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes, Yay! just like they shared in the video, was listening to the Torah portion, just studying the Torah portion one Shabbat at our fellowship, and the command about not to mix wool and linen came up, and I was brand new, and I was curious about it, and somebody in the fellowship said something like, it has something to do with the frequency of the cloth and electricity and things like that. And then somebody else said, oh, no, it has to do with not mixing the, the holy with the profane. It's, it's only got a spiritual application. There's no physical application. And somebody else said, no, everything has both a physical and a spiritual application. Anyway, I was fascinated by it, but I didn't really pursue it until after I had been to my first Sukkot and met a person who dressed head to toe in linen. This person said, I just feel so good when I wear linen. Now, I had been into things like earthing, Mm -hmm. you know, where you walk barefoot to discharge built up static electricity. I know for a fact that that is a real thing. And when I was in sound engineering school, we talked a lot about frequency. So I understood how frequencies can cancel each other out Mm -hmm. and how everything in the world has frequency, including mass and sound and air and color and light and all everything. So I've been fascinated with that ever since I was in audio school. Anyway, I started wearing linen just one piece at a time. I started out with a shirt and it's funny because I really felt I really felt self-conscious in this one linen shirt. Wow. And I made sure I was very careful to keep it very ironed. Mm-mm. I was accustomed to, you know, permanent press. Yeah. Oh, I always wore polyester. And that was what I was used to. Mm-hmm. And as time went on and I started collecting more linen clothing, and then I got my linen sheets. I don't know. Over time, I have found that now I wear almost exclusively linen. I have one t-shirt and one pair of jean shorts. And everything else that I own is linen. Wow. That's wonderful. Tell me your linen story, how you became a linenite. You know, I I don't know. I, I really don't know. I just know I found it, used it, wore it, enjoyed it, and just kept going with it. And I can't stop buying it now. I'm a linen freak, you know. And now the know. people that I'm watching are ta- showing you how to use these patterns more appropriately with the larger items that you find. And I'm being able to make all kinds of cool stuff. So now I got to switch out everything I thought I was going to keep that was cotton or something, you know, and, and just start doing that with my leftovers. Nice. Yeah. It's, um, it's a journey for sure. And it's, um, I'm a tosser and a turner. So I go through sheets faster than, a, than the average person. <laughs> so I do need a new set of yeah. sheets. They didn't last for very long, but oh, yeah, I just need to bad. get thicker ones or something. Yeah. Well, I actually, I have a duvet. Oh, you know what? That might work. Yeah, duvet. Can you just tell us what the video link is that you and I have been talking about? The YouTube person who is also somebody I would recommend um, watching is Nathan Reynolds, R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S on YouTube. Awesome. Becoming a Linenite. Is that what it's called? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. (laughs) And they recommend books that you can you know, learn about frequency and learn about linen. And, you know, he's now he's talking about the ephod and the armor and, oh my goodness, I can't wait to get in all that. Well, I do know. Okay. So here's what I know for sure. Mm -hmm. When I was in audio school, I learned that if you double a frequency exactly in phase, which means it is, it's going on its up wave and it's down wave at exactly the same time, that will amplify. It will basically double the loudness, the level of the frequency. Mm -hmm. But if you have them exactly 180 degrees out of phase, where they're perfectly opposite, where one is going up and reaches its peak at the same time the other is reaching its low peak, they're called out of phase and they cancel each other out. Mm. Now, the frequency of linen is 5,000. And it is a protective frequency. It protects you from electromagnetic frequencies, from radiation. There's theories out there that it'll protect you from viruses and bacteria and fungal and parasitic infections and all these other things. You know, and I think that is as long as the viewers can hear this <laughs> and know that that basically, I think that's more the, you know, pure linen. Don't get it bleached or yeah. colored if you really want right. that kind of protection and assistance and whatever else you're doing. Because once you start bleaching and coloring, it weakens that power. I don't know by how much yet, but that's something to think about. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. 
So on the other on the other side of this, we have wool, which has the exact same frequency number, 5,000, mm -hmm. as linen. It has the same characteristics, only in a different type, because you have one that's plant, one that's animal. When you put them together, they cancel each other out. So you are left completely unprotected mm -hmm. when you're wearing linen and wool together. I hate doing that, too, because it's so hard to find organic cotton cheap enough I know. <laughs> that you're like, I kind of want to just throw my wool over my linen and you're just like, exactly. Ah. I know. And I feel like that I'll be wearing my linen and I have this alpaca wool poncho that's super warm yeah. and I just want to put it on. And then I realize, okay, even though they're not woven together in the same garment, am I canceling out all the positive benefits right. or is it okay if I do it this way? I just don't know. Right. And what am I going to wear underneath my wool poncho? Exactly. <laughs> you know, I think we're going to have to order some organic cotton t-shirts or something. I don't, that's the only thing I can think of. Right. Right. Or maybe just some wool stuff or some bamboo. Bamboo would probably be Ooh, neutral. I forgot to look at that. Yeah. So, you know, in the Bible, it says that the high priest mm. is the only person who is allowed to wear a garment that is made of linen and wool together. Ooh. And it makes me wonder, this is just my theory. Mm -hmm. And I know it's going to sound kind of grandiose and I'm probably going to make a fool out of myself, but if the linen frequency and the wool frequency cancel each other out and they leave that priest completely unprotected when he walks into the presence of Jehovah the Almighty, I wonder if that's him being more open and vulnerable to God. And his protection? Where he has no, oh, no protection right, whatsoever. Right. Yeah. So the, the linen and the wool have canceled each other out. He has no protection from his garments wow. like he's completely armorless i don't i don't know yeah. that could be just completely off base but i have wondered about that often yeah. every time we go through that particular that's interesting portion. i i don't remember reading that so i have to check that out i need to get all my linen verses together and start getting sharpshooter about it yeah well, and the other thing that Nathan and his wife were talking about was they get wool garments for the winter. Yeah. Linen for summer and wool for winter. Now, I've just been wearing linen year round, and that's when I run into the problem of how do I put my poncho on over my linen? Right. So maybe I can solve my own problem by <laughs> just buying some wool for winter. Yeah. And I live in Oregon. You know, it's going to be winter much sooner here than it is where you are. Yeah. So maybe I should start thinking about that. Yeah. We used to raise sheep. And I used to save the wool and I don't know what I was going to do with it, but it wasn't the right kind of wool for making fabric. Oh, yeah. I tried to do that one time and tan my own hides and everything. And I, I got <laughs> so frustrated. And then as soon as I was ready to throw them in my trash, my husband goes, okay, I'll help. And I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> Isn't it funny what kind of weird projects we get into? <laughs> I, I had to have my own natural homegrown linen, though. I know. And I thought I got to this property here in Oregon where I'm living. There's 10 acres. It's mostly very dense fur, but there's like a little field out here. And I thought, how many acres of flax could I grow? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I want to live on a farm where I can grow flax. I'm I know, but you have to grow like a thousand acres to make one bolt of fabric. That's wow. the problem. And that's why linen is so expensive oh. because it takes so much to make it. I know, but you know, even just if I did a little bit and, and went through the process of having a couple of, you know, an omer or whatever you call it, when you take that handful there at first fruit yeah. and, and grab yeah. it and then shuck it and comb it and all that stuff that they do with it and then lay it out and to get wet and dry oh, and wet cool. and dry and see that whole process because you know if you watch those videos of how they make linen it's like it's like our christian walk i mean you know and, and our faith ever since we've had to be set apart it's it's all about refining and softening and getting rid of the chaff and you know it's just amazing amazing Ooh, and pounding and breaking and twisting and ringing yeah. right ah <laughs> uh, i can relate we all should experience that at some point. Maybe, maybe, maybe somebody will start a farm like that. That would be so awesome. That would be cool. Anyway, okay, let's move on. I still have a couple questions I want to ask. Okay. So, what has the journey been like from the beginning since you became a Torah keeper? I know you had struggles with your marriage, but can you be specific in how it changed your day to day life? And well, you know, my husband and I were both firstborns, stubborn, and 
You know, we just were constantly debating and I wasn't wise enough in the beginning to be able to say what I needed to say about the New Testament in order for it to click for him. You know, it's this wicked generation that asks for a sign. You just, you have to take God's word for what it is. I mean, it was really, really hard, really, really hard. And I had to cry out vengeance as mine, says the Lord, many, 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 many times in a day just to get through. And, um, but you know, he draws us near. I've never been great with being on my knees and praying for hours and whatever, as much as a prayer where I thought I was at times. It's not something I'm extremely consistent in. And of course, when there's needs and things I need to do about prayer and Every day we say the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew, but, you know, it's a weak point in me. And he just wanted me to draw close and and trust in him. And every opportunity that I've had to be able to trust in him, starting with last year when I got the announcement of this divorce, and then I got my appendix you know, it was bursting in my belly and I I didn't want to go to the hospital. And I finally just had a friend said, you know, you just need to go. <laughs> and thank <laughs> God I did. But, um, yeah. you know, it, I've had to trust him so much. And, you know, it's all about giving those things in our life back to him that we hold on to. And, you know, it, and some of us are still holding on to stuff or whatever. I, you know, I'm daily tested about it sometimes. And right now I'm just going through this, hearing that still small voice. It's just committing to those times and people and places again. And I hear that little voice, you know, he's saying, you know, call them, tell this and do that. And, and it's just so small, but I know it's there and I just need to obey it. So I think we all take a lesson in that because at some point, you know, it's going to get to the point where we have to make quick decisions and we're not going to know what to do and go right or left. And we need to listen to that Holy Spirit telling us where to go and what to do. God's using you in a mighty way right now. And I just hope that these testimonies get out and are a blessing to other people because um, I am just so enjoying each one of them. I've listened to almost all of them and I just so am awed by your talent and your voice and, um, you know, your questions and the information that's getting out because we're all so unique in this walk. I mean, there are some things that we are ultra similar, but for the most part, you know, it's, we come up from different places, different things happen in our lives yeah, to we do. spark us on. Well, so on that note, can you tell me who are your favorite resources right now? Well, right now I'm watching Bill Cloud and Mark Bilt on Shabbat. And then Nathan Reynolds, I'm just going to absorb myself in some of his challenges and different things that he's doing right now, because he's one of those people that takes his walk very seriously and he just moves ahead and applies everything that he's learning. Yeah, for sure. Challenging, inspiring. Yes. We all need to be challenged and inspired, especially in the times we are in. Yeah, And it it encourages me to eat more healthy because he's like so on a health kick and working on organic farms that he's just like, he can't stop talking. He's just like, he talks a mile a minute, you know, and you can still understand it, but he, he just is, he's thinking, you know, we need to use our brains and just be thinking. So it's wonderful. Awesome. So would you do me a favor? And sure. will you close us out with the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew? Sure. Abinu, Shabbat Shemaim, Yit Kadesh, Shimka, Tibe, Melkutka, Yesha, Ratsunka, Ba'aretz, Ha'asher, Nesha, Bashamayim, Ten Lanu, Hayom, Lechem Kokono, Usulak Lanu, Eta Shemot Nu Ka'asher, Solachem, Naknu, La'asher, Asher Lanu, Ual Tibenu, Lide Masa, Kiem Hatilanu Minhara, Kilcha, Maimacha, Uha Gabura, Uha Tuperut, Ulame, at Ulamem. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. I appreciate you finally sitting down with me. Thank <laughs> you. And sharing Thank your you. story. Thank you for listening to Walk Like a Hebrew. You can learn more about linen and its properties by going to livinglinen.com. Please like our Facebook page at Walk Like a Hebrew and follow us on Instagram. And don't forget to share the podcast with family and friends. Subscribe to Walk Like a Hebrew on your favorite podcast app and leave us a good review so more people can have the chance to hear these wonderful testimonies. As always, thank you to Jack Lane for so many things, including the music. If you'd like a free copy of Jack's CD, please send an email to jacklane at earthlink.net. May Yahweh bless you. We'll catch you next time.